Hello everyone, welcome. It's our weekly time of recording to uh, present God's Word, to teach God's Word. And this is a uh, is something that, that I believe is, is important just for the, uh, the presence of our church here in the community or around our, uh, the, war, the, the country. Uh, I know there are people in other places that are watching these. And I trust that God can use all of this. I humbly come before this camera. I realize every single week that I am unworthy and I am just definitely a product of God's grace. And I don't deserve what he's done. I don't deserve the privileges he's given me to be able to teach the word. But I want to use that for his glory. And that's just, a, that's, that's such an important thing. It really is. So, um... As always, I want to pray, ask God to bless this time that we spend together, and then I'm going to present God's Word from Romans chapter 12. We're looking at those instructions that come between chapter 12, 9, verse 9 through 21. We're not covering that whole passage. In fact, we're going to be covering that passage in segments and looking at it from a contextual perspective. Paul wrote that years ago. I'll, I'll present this now. He wrote that years ago to the Roman Christians. These are probably people that were saved at Pentecost. At least many of them were. There were people from all over the world there in Jerusalem following Christ's resurrection and uh, his ascension into heaven. And there were people there. Paul wanted to get to Rome. He wanted to be able to preach the gospel further there. But yet he knew there were some followers of Christ that were amongst those, the, 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 the people there. And uh, he wrote, there was probably a sense of, how do we do this? We've got Jews here. We've got Gentiles here. We've got Jews that have come to faith in Christ. We've got Gentiles who have. We've got Gentiles who have not come to faith in Christ. How do we work in this environment, basically? How does this work in this environment? That's why Paul wrote. And... We need to understand that, and he centers there, and I'm going to explain this more clearly here in a little bit, he centers on the gospel throughout the whole book of Romans. That is his focal point, and we'll consider that, we'll, we'll recognize that here in a few moments. I said we were going to pray, so forgive me for not praying right away. I, I get to teaching or preaching or explaining things, and uh just need to come before our Father and ask for help. Father, I do need you. I need you every moment for many reasons. You know what's going on in my life. I, I, I repeat Psalm 139. You know when I stand up. You know when I sit down. You know when I lay down to rest. You know what I'm going to say before I say it. And you know that for all of us. You are an almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing God. And I worship you. I praise you. I thank you that you are so wondrously great. And I praise you for your grace, that grace that is extended to us to give us things we do not deserve, to take away those penalties that we do deserve through our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Thank you for that, Father. I pray that you will guide this study today, help it to be effective, help it to be clear, and help me to present these truths in a fashion that will give honor and glory to you beyond anything else. I praise you. I love you. I pray for all those that are listening. I pray for all those with needs around us. There are circumstances that people face that are very challenging in this culture, in this society. And all of us realize that. So, Father, we turn to you. You are our source. You are our strength. You are our security. And we praise you. We love you. We thank you. And we ask that you use these moments today, Father, to bring glory to yourself. Guard the things that are in my mind from distracting me. Guide the things that are in my mind to come out in my mouth in a very clear fashion. And I pray, Father, that you will be, be honored, that the church can be built up, and that you will help in this time for your glory, Father. I pray this. Thank you for Jesus Christ. We ask this all in his wondrous, powerful name, his saving name. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, you know, years ago, I was called to pastor a church in another area, another area of the country, basically. It, I thought it was the Midwest, but it really, there was a different culture there. It was outside of the bounds of what I would consider the actual Midwest. And um, 
That church had experienced some real difficult times prior to the time when I got there. Um, they'd had some church discipline that had to be carried out. And in fact, a pastor had to be disciplined for immorality. There was a pastor that came. He came with the understanding he would be a short-term leader there in that church. And he had an effective ministry. And the, device, the, the divisiveness that had taken place through all these events, they were, they were discouraging. They were um, devastating to this church. And the problems, the destructiveness that had taken place, the problems were so significant that, you know, this pastor came and knew, I'm going to be doing a healing ministry through the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, he was there for about three years, if I understand things correctly. I talked to him on the phone a number of times. I never met him personally. And he basically determined he felt the church had overcome all the difficulties and they were ready to move forward. So... I was called, I became their pastor, and I realized not long after I got there that there were many heartaches, there were many triggers of things that had taken place that when something else happened, people became again discouraged, they became divided, and there was a, tr a problem with unity in the church. And I was a young pastor, this was my first senior pastorate. And I was there, and I admit, I was in over my head. I was overwhelmed. I needed God's strength. I needed God's understanding. I needed God's provision of revival and um, unity. God loves unity. God desires unity for the church. Unity is one of the things that attracts us, you know, attracts the world to us. I started to say that a little bit backwards. So unity in the church attracts the world to us. They see this and say, we want this. We love this. We look at culture. We look at society. There's disunity all over. There's much disunity in Washington, D.C. right now. We hear that on the news. There's much disunity in Madison. There's disunity in every government force or every government place because there are different viewpoints. There are different opinions. There are different thoughts that, that, that people, this has to happen or this has to happen. And we're looking for that sense of how do we get it all together? And that's what the church needs too. And the church today in our culture, when you look around, see some churches are teaching this particular viewpoint. And many times that viewpoint can be unbiblical, can be incorrect. Churches are trying to focus on the scriptures. And yet we have many denominations. We have many different types of churches. And the church, according to the society is a divided group. Society doesn't see us as unified. And I think there are some ways in which we try to unify. Sometimes we say, well, let's only focus on the essentials. But the question is, who, what are the essentials? That's an issue too. So what I want to do today is I want us to look at Romans chapter 12 and realize that there is a, a recipe for unity in that particular passage. I've entitled this basically, Emphasizing the Unity Within Community. And as I say this, as I begin this message, I want to read a couple passages of Scripture that acquaint us with the, uh, it introduces what I'm going to be saying, but it's not the passage I'm preaching today. Preaching from Romans 12, <clears throat> verses 9 through 16. But uh, <clears throat> as we look at that, it's important for us, what's context? What does the Bible say to us that helps us to get in, uh, introduced to or get initiated into this particular viewpoint that we're seeing in Romans 12? Well, number one, Paul wrote in, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. I could preach a three-point message on that passage, and, and there'd be a lot that could be said, but I want that to be just introductory. Notice this, what it says there, the goal of our instruction. Why do I teach God's Word? To present the love of God, and that people will have that love that comes from a pure heart, because we've trusted Christ, has a good conscience, because our sins are taken care of, and we don't have to be guilty, and then a sincere faith. That's that authentic trust in Jesus Christ that keeps us moving. 
Or another passage where John writes in, in 1 John chapter 4, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and everyone who loves is a child of God and knows God personally. The one who does not love doesn't know God, for God is love. So when love is missing, we have to realize God's not in the formula. And then the last section I want to read is from John 13, verses 34 and 35. This is Jesus right before he was taken out to the garden, or when he went out to the garden and was arrested. This is in, in, in the upper room, just as Jesus is teaching his, his disciples. He says, a new commandment I'm giving you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you. Notice a commandment to love each other in a sacrificial way. Let's read on. He says that you also love one another. He says that again. He, he repeats that. He says, by this, all men, all people will know that you are my faithful followers if you love one another. That's the sign to the world that we are different because we love each other. That is a contributing factor to the effectiveness of the church. The love within the body. And I think that unity is something that sometimes evades us. Sometimes we are doing things that are causing a sense of disunity and we don't even realize it. We may say something that is very innocent and yet people will take it incorrectly. Now the fact they take it incorrectly, I don't know if it's their fault or the person that said it's fault. And yet it's a problem. Why is it a problem? Because the adversary... The, 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 the devil, so to speak. Yeah, there's the devil in the details. The devil is going to dis, dis, deceive. He's going to dis, disrupt. He's going to distract. And we need to understand that. Now, I want to also look at some very essential reminders. This is all from our study in Romans over the last numbers of weeks. But the foundational focus of Romans, this book that Paul wrote, he wrote it to Jews who were followers of Christ. He wrote it to Gentiles who were followers of Christ. He wrote it to the church at Rome. And he wanted that church at Rome to recognize what the gospel does, what it had done for them, and what it does as they present it. And the foundational focus of Romans is God's gracious message that Jesus Christ died to rescue sinners from the penalty, from the power, and from the presence of sin. I am saved as a follower of Christ from the penalty. I am being saved from the power of sin. And I will be saved when I reach my glorified body from the presence of sin. And Paul presents those things. Romans 1.16 clearly expresses, Paul expresses this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who truly trusts, to the Jew first, but then also to the Gentile. And everything that Christ has accomplished for us that are expressed so clearly in Romans, especially Romans 1 through 8, all those particular truths, doctrinal truths that tell us we're saved by grace. God demonstrated his love toward us and while we're still sinners, he died for us. He sent Christ to be our Savior. Everything that Christ accomplished for us has no value if a person has never humbled himself by acknowledging his sin and then accepting Christ's, Christ's gracious gift. And we have to understand that. People around us who have never truly trusted in Christ, or if you, you know, you're wondering, have I trusted Christ? Am I a Christian or not? Actually, I've never had anybody come to me that would say, I'm fearful that I'm not a Christian. Do you think I am? I've never had anybody that, that wasn't probably saved. I've had people that needed to be saved that came to me, yes. But they didn't ask me if, I was a, if they were a Christian. But nonetheless, what Christ has accomplished is of no value if we've not truly trusted Christ. In other words, we need the, 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 that faith in Christ and we need the Holy Spirit that, that, that provides for us so that we can accomplish things that will bring unity, that will bring a sense of, of purpose to the church. But now what I will last want to say is the lists of inspired instructions and practical principles in Romans 12 through chapter 15 are impossible to obey without the power provided us 
by the Holy Spirit who indwells every faithful follower of Christ. If I don't work with the power of the Spirit uh, you know, strengthening me, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spin my wheels. And the inspired instructions and the pr practical principles given to us in Romans 12 through 15, they're impossible for us to obey unless we've truly trusted in Christ. Unless we're allowing the Holy Spirit to motivate and to uh, basically control our lives. Uh, I say that. I, I'm searching for a word and, and, and control, I guess, is what I really want to say. Now, I believe there are four R's that relate to Romans 12, 9 through 21. Number one, the renewing power of God's indwelling spirit. That renewing power, I'm being renewed day in and day out by the Holy Spirit. Secondly, our respect for God's authority over our lives. If we are not respecting God's authority, then there's going to be an issue that develops. Thirdly, our relationships with people around us, especially the saints. Paul is describing, he's defining, he's giving us a sense of, of definition of what is it that we need to be doing, what is it that we should be doing in order for our relationships with people around us to be what God wants. And that's especially important for us who are followers of Christ. There is a certain set of standards that we need to say, okay, I want this to be taking place in my life, and we're going to look at those things in the message today. We're not going to look at every aspect of it. We're not going to look at all the different things that are recorded in this passage because it's too much for us to do in the time of period in the time period we have. But number four, Romans 12, 9 through 21 is also focusing on, there's a relationship here of the what is the reputation that we have with people who observe our behavior? What is the world saying about the church? What are others saying about those of us that are followers of Jesus Christ here at ACEFC, what is the reputation? Do we control that reputation? Not entirely, but there are certain things that we can and should be doing that will have an impact upon that, res that, that reputation. So those are the four R's. Now, as we pause for a moment, we take a breath. That was a lot of information there in a little bit of time. I want to start this message by referring or reviewing, referring to and reviewing the three priorities that, that filter our actions and attitudes that are included in Romans 12, verse 9. There are three priorities given by Paul that filter our actions and our attitudes. And basically, they purify those, those actions and attitudes. How do they do that? Because the three things that are said there, number one, love with no secret or hidden agenda. We should love one another in a true, authentic, honest way. We should speak the truth in love. When we speak the truth in love, if we're going to tell somebody something that they don't necessarily want to hear, we need to do it in a compassionate, caring way. But love with no hidden or secret agenda. That is so important. That's a filtering system. Secondly, we should never surrender to the evil influences, the evil ideas, the evil ideals, and the evil idols that surround us or that, that sometimes affect our thinking. There are, there, there's evil influence around us, and we are sometimes drawn to that. There are evil ideas that we hear every single day. We may hear vulgar language. We may hear other things that people say. We may hear immoral things that are expressed. There are evil ideas. There are evil ideals that the world presents to us. Well, you should do this, or you should, allow, you should let yourself go and do this. And these different evil ideals that sometimes become various... Uh, activities or events that people, oh, I, I, I can't wait for that. I want to do that. Why, why am I limited? And then finally, we never surrender to the evil idols. I've mentioned a few times recently, there are certain idols that I've d identified in my life. Athletics and sports were one, were, were, you know, that's one of them. And, and various other things. I think sometimes we can idolize family members or idolize certain people. And suddenly that becomes a, a distraction to our relationship with Jesus Christ. 
And, you know, we need to be careful there. So never surrender to evil. And then the third area of filtering is saturate our minds with God's word. Fill your mind with God's Word day in and day out. Meditate on it. Memorize it. Let it become a measuring stick for how well am I doing. And that saturation of our minds, as it says in, in, in Psalm 119.11, Your Word have I treasured, have I hidden in my heart to keep me from sin. And that's important. That's necessary. So, Two questions that introduce where we're going next. How do we place an emphasis on unity within community, within our community? How does the, those, those last five letters of community become evident in, in our relationships, in our activities, in our ministry? How do we place an emphasis on unity within our community? And then secondly... What should characterize a faithful follower of Christ? That's what we're answering here. What should which characterize? Now, the passage itself, let me read this passage from, 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 from Romans chapter 12. And as I read this passage, this is something we've, we've, we've heard various parts of this before in this series. But I'm reading a little bit farther than I've read in the past. And I'm going to read it now, and then I'm going to go through it piece by piece in an expositional way. We see here, Paul writes and says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor or hate that which is evil, and cling for all your worth to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love, brotherly affection. Give preference to one another in honor. Give preference to one another by honoring one another, honoring each other's desires and, and, and needs. Not lagging behind in diligence, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. We're not serving necessarily, you know, we may say, I'm serving this person over here, but they do things that bother me so much I can't do it, I can't do it. No, we're serving the Lord. We'll get into that here a little bit more as, as we consider, continue. Reading on, rejoicing in hope, persevering in oppression, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And he finally says, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, do not be proud, but rather associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own estimation. And we'll stop there and we'll carry on with this, this section of scripture next week as we continue in this study. But what do we see in this? There are three basically divisions that I've made of this passage. And first off, I want us to understand we should be characterized as faithful followers of Christ by the evidence of our commitment to each other. It should show that we are committed to each other. And Paul gives certain instructions here. He starts off and says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Being devoted there, that describes the idea of a particular dedication. We're dedicated to this particular aspect of this particular activity. We're going to dedicate ourselves to being loving to one another. We're going to be determined that we will love each other. And we are de devoted to one another in brotherly love. Let's realize that's the idea of Philadelphia love. And I realize some people say, Philadelphia? Wait a minute, what's that have to do with it? Well, that city was named after this particular word, which is a word also of a city in the Bible. The city of Philadelphia, Paul wrote to, or I mean, Jesus expressed and John wrote in Revelation to the church at Philadelphia. So we realize that there's, there's that, that name, but it's more than a name. It's a description of the type of love, the type of compassion, the type of affection that we should have for one another. And as we look at that, we should understand that, that um, this term basically emphasizes the idea 
of a dedicated family style attraction. Now, what does that mean? It means that our love as a family, as a church family, as a body of believers, our love for the church at large, for those that are followers of Jesus Christ, that should be so attractive that other people will see it and say, I'd love to have that. I want to have that. And sadly, I've heard from way too many people through the years that they look at the church and say, well, you people can't get along. You people, I mean, you have all kinds of different viewpoints, all kinds of different doctrines. Yes, there are certain areas where we're all unique and we all have differences. But because of what Christ has done for us, we are brought together in unity. We are unified by the gospel. And as we're instructed by Paul here, we should be devoted to one another in brotherly love. That's a sense of dedication, determination. That's a sense of looking at one another and saying, we are family. We support each other. We have each other's backs. We're working to help one another when we, each other needs help and all that. So this is a love that is not necessarily based on affection, it's not based on physical characteristics or personal traits. It's based on the fact that we are brought together by the love of Christ, by the gospel of Jesus. And we are devoted to one another in brotherly love. That's number one. Secondly, when I say number one, actually in the notes, this is all, all these things I'm saying right now are under the, the category of the first point. There is evidence of our commitment to one another. It shows. People see it. This is what people do see. But secondly, the next phrase there is give preference or give priority to one another in honor. And basically the, the word preference, the word that's used there, the Greek word that's used for preference, is the idea of putting the well-being of others ahead of ourselves. We are concerned about what's best for the other person. We're going to give preference to the other person. We're going to do like, like Paul writes in, in Philippians chapter 2, that Jesus, he came and died on the cross for our sins by giving preference for us, that type of, of concern, that type of care and compassion. And basically, we're told by, by Paul in that passage in Philippians chapter 2, that we should consider our other people's interests above our own. That's hard to do. We live in a very, very... A difficult world where we're all challenged and sometimes we are very much triggered into wow I'm facing so many problems how can I care for others I got to take care of myself and that's a that's a genuine concern that's valid but Paul says in all of this realize there's unity in the body there's togetherness in the body and therefore, as we, we, as we show honor, we, we, what we're doing, we're showing, we're showing respect, we're showing admiration, we're showing appreciation for others. We're realizing that we're not in this thing alone. We need each other. So we give preference, we give priority to one another in honor. And what we see here is this passage continually, it builds on each point that's made. Because the next thing that Paul says basically in this, this is not lagging behind in diligence. He says fervent in spirit, allowing the spirit to give us that sense of urgency. And then we're serving the Lord. Yes, we're serving people, but let's look at the people and say, okay, I'm serving Christ when I serve a person, when I help a person. I'm serving the Lord. And I'm not serving my own personal interests. I'm not even necessarily serving that other person because, oh, you know, that person is, 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 is so hard to serve. They're, 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 they're prickly. And, and as we look at that, we, we say, oh, I can't do this. Well, no, I'm not. We need to see Christ as the one that we're serving. We're serving the Lord. And therefore, there's devotion in motion. We're devoted to brotherly love. We're devoted to caring for each other. We're, 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 our devotion is in motion. It's something we, we're, we're diligent the idea of diligence, that's the idea of, of sensing an urgency to be able to do what needs to be done. Not wasting time, not delaying, but we're, we're diligent to make sure that it gets done properly. So 
That's what he says there. But now the next thing that he says in this first point, the idea of the evidence that shows of our commitment towards one another, it, it is shown by the idea that we are rejoicing in hope. We're persevering in the midst of op oppression and opposition. And we're devoted to prayer. And basically, that is saying that, number one, we're focused on the hope that the Lord provides us. We have hope because Jesus Christ provided for us a promise of heaven, a promise of a future that is better than anything we could ever imagine here on earth. We are not necessarily, uh, we're, we're, we're residents here on earth, but we're citizens of heaven if we've trusted in Jesus Christ. That's a hope. Every single day I look forward to the, 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 the potential, to the possibilities that Christ could come and snatch us away and take us to glory. And we're rejoicing in hope. We're persevering in the midst of oppression and opposition. We're together on this. And persevering, that literally means to be able to remain under the pressure because God gives us the ability to do so. We're remaining under the pressure of the oppression and the opposition that the world brings to us. We don't run away from it. We stand up to it. And we remain under the pressure because God gives us the ability to do that. That, that Greek word, it's hupomeno, to remain under. Hupomeno, to remain under the pressure. Why? Because God gives us the ability to persevere. He gives us the strength. Together we can do that. When we're alone, there's strength in numbers. So what is, as a follower of Christ, with other followers of Christ working together, we can persevere under oppression and opposition. And then finally, what it is, is we're devoted to prayer. Prayer is always our number one resource, and it's our first resort. Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, Don't be anxious but instead pray. The first resort is prayer. And when we pray, God will give us the peace that passes what's on our, in our minds, in our, in, our, in our thoughts, give us the peace that passes over that and gives us that sense of security and assurance. So we're devoted to prayer. So the evidence of our commitment to each other, that's the first, first point here. But secondly, how is it that we uh, emphasize the unity and community? How is it that we are characterized for the world to see what should characterize our lives? Well, secondly, there are the efforts of our concern for each other. There's a sense of we make the effort. We are willing to go the second mile. We're willing to do what needs to be done. And I realize that we, we need a retreat. We need rest. But we also need to recognize, okay, there are efforts that we should be making to, to demonstrate our concern for each other. Sometimes people feel, feel very alone. Sometimes other Christians feel alone. They feel like, oh, the world is against me, and I don't even have anybody else that's supporting me. There are people that have financial needs. There are people that have physical needs. There are people that have various concerns, and they are overwhelmed. And we as a church... We as followers of Christ, we need to demonstrate effort that, that, that shows that we're concerned for each other. The world should see that and be attracted to what we are and who we are because of Jesus Christ working through us or the Holy Spirit working through us. And he says, first, contributing to the needs of the saints. Literally, contributing, that is... The word that's given there in the Greek language is the idea of a stewardship of what God has provided us and enables us to share with others. We, we make good use of our resources. We make good use of our funds. We make good use. Of, we don't waste what God has given us. There's a stewardship involved in this. We need to be able to contribute to the needs of the saints. And when we set up our budgets... We should have a fund in our budget that says, this is for church giving. And I think every one of us, in fact, I don't teach or preach nearly often enough according to what some folks would say and what I feel convicted right now in saying this. I think we need to teach on what the Bible says about giving. Giving to the church, giving to others. Giving is a sense of meeting needs. When the church is hurting for funds, people say, okay, I need to dig deeper. 
I need to find the resources. I need to, okay, maybe I shouldn't go out to eat this week. I should give that money to the church. Maybe I shouldn't buy this particular thing I've been looking forward to buying, been saving for this, but maybe I need to take some of those dollars and give that to contribute to the needs of the saints. Now, specifically, Paul says the needs of the saints, the idea of saints, that's God's family. And we should be looking toward each other. There's a community down in, in, in the, well, I won't even I define where this is. I'm familiar with a community of Christians that they are so vested in each other that no one ever has a financial need in that particular community. And when they have financial needs, they help each other deal with their budgets. They help each other get things straight. But yet people pay each other's bills. People help each other in that area. And they're doing that. Why? Because we're followers of Christ. And we want the world to see that we take care of each other. We contribute to the needs of the saints. We don't let anybody go hungry. God says the, 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 the faithful will never be hungry. Why? Because the saints contribute to the needs of one another. And now what are the needs? Those are the requirements for life. Now, as we look at the idea of needs, the Greek word that's there is defining the idea that we need to be open about our needs. Not necessarily begging and saying, oh, woe is me, I've got such a problem, but yet open. Say, you know what, I, I'm concerned about this, or I have this challenge. It requires openness, it requires honesty, and it also requires a sense of humility. Sometimes we need to say, okay, I'll humble myself by accepting from somebody else that which I can't. I can't pay for myself. I'll accept it from others. I'm not going to be proud. I'm not going to say, okay, uh, you know, I, I can't do this. Now, I think there are some people that take things for granted, or there are some people that, that they basically, they take advantage of others. That's wrong. But it's just contributing to the needs of the saints. That's, that's one of the efforts we make to show concern for each other. But then secondly, in this second point, we are practicing hospitality. Now, that issue of hospitality, what does that mean? That's a desire to reach out and encourage people to feel welcome in our midst. This isn't necessarily about our houses. This isn't necessarily about where we live. This is about how we treat other people, how we make them feel welcome, how we reach out to be friendly Proverbs says that if a person needs friends, if a person wants friends, he needs to be friendly. And we who are followers of Jesus Christ, we need to be friendly. And basically, we reach out and encourage people with a sense of welcomeness, with a sense of you, you welcome to us. We, we reach out and, and, and receive them. We may be receiving people that are necessarily not, you know, I, I read where uh, one, one pastor, as he preached this passage, he says, you know, sometimes I need to get close to people that I would have never even spoken to or sat next to when I was in high school. I need to realize that I lived a life at one time where I was judgmental and those person, I, I don't want to be with those people. We need to be careful about the friends we make. We need to be careful about the influences and the impact of people upon our lives, yes. But we also need to be friendly. We need to practice hospitality. This is not limited merely to opening up our homes. It goes beyond that. It means we need to have open lives with a sense of sincerity and concern for other people. And therefore, we're making an effort that our concern for one another will demonstrate that Christ is at the center of our lives. But now we move on to the last point, the effectiveness of our connection to each other. Is there an effectiveness that develops because we're connected? Or is it broken? Are the connections broken? Is there a sense of disunity that's developed? And therefore, there is no connection. There's no communication. There's no sense of togetherness. The effectiveness of our connection through Christ, through the gospel, we are connected. We are brothers and sisters in the family of God. And basically, what does Paul say in this? He tells us, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Therefore, we are sharing burdens and blessings with one another. 
We know what's going on in each other's lives in a very transparent, compassionate way. And you know what's interesting? I've, through the years, I've been harmed by a sense of I've trusted someone and they've broken the trust. Or I've been hurt by different situations. I've had that happen way more times than what I'd like to describe today. I can't describe them all. And you know what? If, if I were a bitter person, I, wouldn't, I would not be in the ministry today. I'll just say that clearly. God has worked in my life. This is not me. This is God's work in my life. I would not be in the ministry today if I were a bitter and embittered person. Because the reality is, is the hurts, the bruises, the, the burdens that have taken place through the years, they are overwhelming. And I know maybe you can say the same thing for what you've experienced. But as followers of Christ, there needs to be a, con a, con a connectedness that enables us to rejoice with those that rejoice. I can get excited. I can be going through a difficult time, but I can get excited because someone else has had a blessing. I rejoice with that person. I see someone else. I can be happy. I can be thrilled over something that's going on. And I can see somebody that is struggling in, 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 in grief or sorrow, and I weep with that person. We're sharing blessings. We're sharing burdens. We're communicating with each other in a compassionate, caring way by rejoicing and weeping together. We see next, it says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Now, basically what that says is that there should be a, a turning of the other cheek when we are being harmed by others. We need to be gracious. We need to be understanding. I think sometimes we tend to hold grudges way too long. And I know maybe in certain ways I've, I've done that. There have been times when I realized that I needed to let go of something. And when I finally let go, you know, weights were, were just taken off my, my shoulders. The stress in my neck just literally left when I say, I let go. This is God. It's in your hands. And we need to be turning the other cheek. We need to be compassionate and understanding. We need to sense that struggle that someone else has and be gracious to them. I've failed in that area. I'm certain that you failed in that area. But we need to turn the other cheek like Jesus says. We need to be presenting and proclaiming God's love in how we carry out our business. Presenting and proclaiming God's love. The next thing that he tells us is be of the same mind toward one another. Basically, that is the idea. There's a oneness in our purpose. And what is our purpose? I'm going to glorify God. I'm going to give honor and glory to God Almighty. I'm going to present the gospel of Jesus Christ. As Paul said in the book of Romans, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for that is the power of God to change the world where we live. It's the power of God to change the world. And let's all realize that it's not political things that are going to take place that are going to change the world. It's not things that globalists are saying. It's not climate change. It's not things like that. The gospel is the change agent. The love of God through Jesus Christ. The power of the cross. And we need to uh, basically... Uh, say, okay, I'll present and, 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 and proclaim God's love. I will have this mutual understanding. I will be of the same mind towards one another. I will settle the differences as soon as I can that I have with other people. And sometimes, you know what? It's hard to do that. It's hard to want to do that. We need to work on those things. I feel convicted right now by this. And we need to avoid the divisiveness that takes place within the church. We need to get rid of all the divisiveness. And Paul warns us many times. He warns us here. He warns us about, you know, and, 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 and he, when he says, abhor that which is evil, and we look at, what does God say is evil? The person that is sowing discord within the, within the brethren. The person that's sowing divisiveness. The person that is trying to divide people. Titus chapter 2, Paul writes and says, if there's a divisive person in your midst, literally give him a warning. And after a second warning, say, okay, you're done. We're, we're, we're going to disfellowship from you because you're causing division. You're causing destructiveness. 
Division is dangerous according to God's perspective. Be of the same mind towards one another. Now he warns us, okay, don't be haughty. Don't be haughty in mind. Don't be arrogant. Don't be prideful. Don't look at me yourself and say, well, I've done this better than you, so I'm better than you are. Sometimes we can be so impressed with ourselves. We're going to look at that here in the next point, too. We can be impressed with, I did that so well. Get this, mm-hmm. well, you know what? That's dangerous. Don't be haughty in mind. And he tells us, associate with the humble. James says it. Peter says it. Paul says it. God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And we need to associate with the humble. We need to recognize that there's a sense of privilege that sometimes makes us think we're better. And that's sin. We are not, we are equalized under the cross of Jesus Christ. We're all the same under the cross of Christ. We're sinners that come to him for forgiveness, for grace, for remission of sin, for pardon, for basically rescue from the penalty of sin. We come together. We're all in the same particular boat. And we need to understand that. And therefore, not haughty, not proud, not arrogant, but rather associating in a humble fashion with the humble. And we should be gravitated, we should gravitate towards humility. And then finally, the last point, don't be wise in your own estimation. Paul says, don't be wise in your own estimation. Basically, we should be careful. Don't think that we know it all. I've been in conversations with people, and I'll say this. I've been in conversations with people where I've maybe come across as a know-it-all. And I'm sorry if I've done that. And I, I, I'm, I'm seeking never to do that. But I've been in conversations with other people where you can't get a word in edgewise because they know more than you do. Or you're trying to help somebody. You're trying to encourage somebody. And as you begin, they cut you off. I know that. I'm not that. I, I'm smarter than that. And, and people can have that sense of wise in their own estimation. They don't need other people's help. They don't need other people's advice. They don't hear. They don't listen. They think they know it all. They refuse to listen to good advice. They refuse to listen to direction from God's word. They refuse. They're just like those dads that buy something for their kids, and then they, they say, oh, I can put this together without reading the instructions, and pretty soon they've got a mess in the, in the living room floor or the family room floor because they didn't read the instructions. They thought they knew how to do it. I can say, fortunately, I don't know of any time that I've done that one. Whenever I had something for the kids, I'd look, okay, let's see how to put it together first. And, uh, you know, uh, that's an area where I've, I've, I've been successful, I'll say that. By God's grace, I have been. But we should never be impre- impressed with ourselves. We should say, wait a minute now, I am a recipient of God's gracious blessings, of God's gracious presence in my life. And therefore, I'm not impressed with who I am, I'm impressed with who God is and what he's done for me. So as we look at this and tie these things together, let's realize that there's a sense where, okay, unity is a need. God is blessed and and glorified by unity. And therefore, we should seek, okay, I want to have the evidence of our commitment to each other to, to, to be seen. There's evidence to our commitment to one another. The ch- people outside, there, those people are concerned for each other. They care for each other. They're committed to each other. They're family. Secondly, there are efforts that we carry out that demonstrate our concern for each other. We contribute to each other's needs. We help each other. We practice hospitality. We have open lives where we're transparent, we're open, we're honest. And we welcome people in a very kind, loving way. There's an effort that is made that shows concern. And then thirdly, the effectiveness of our connection. If we're connected, then we're going to rejoice with each other. We're going to weep with each other. If we're connected, we're going to bless those that persecute. We're not going to curse them. We're going to turn the other cheek. And people are going to say, wow, you were able to love someone that was unlovable. That's amazing. 
We're going to be of sa the same mind. We're going to have unity in, in, in thought. We're going, to, we're going to settle differences. We're going to recognize what is the truth. When we look at doctrine, we're going to say, okay, these are the things that are essentials. And I believe that the church has done a very poor job of defining the essentials of our faith. I really think they're broader and bigger than what we ever might recognize. And we need to have lo loving, caring, objective discussions on what does the Bible actually say. I've said many times, I, I fail in several areas, but one thing I will say repeatedly, if you're going to come to me with a disagreement, make sure you show me Bible chapter and verse. Show me what God's Word says. Don't give me an opinion. Give me a biblical truth. Because that's where the foundation is laid. So the effectiveness of our connection, that, that's going to have an impact upon the world around us. So we close then. You know, what conclusions can we draw from this? What are the personal applications that we can take away from this study? Well, number one, the foundation for unity within the church is life-changing trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. The foundation is life-changing trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. If my life isn't changed by trusting in Christ, then there's something that's missing. There's something that's wrong. And therefore, it's authentic heart change. It's a matter of authentic heart change that results from the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. If there's not heart change that is evident because the Spirit is working in my life, then I need to go back to the gospel and say, okay, the gospel is what's necessary because the foundation of unity within the church is life-changing trust in our Lord Jesus Christ. God is glorified and honored by unity within the church, and we're unified by the cross. The power and potential of evil, you abhor that which is evil, you cling for all your worth to what's good, the power and potential of evil disrupts and destroys unity. The adversary wants to deceive, distract, and defeat us by dividing us. Let's be aware of what the enemy is doing through evil means, through evil devices. And let's realize the gospel is God's answer to bring us together in unity. The gospel is what brings us together in unity. So there, secondly, then, in this set of conclusions, is the focus of unity is love. God loved us first. God is love, yet God is also holy and just. So his love isn't this, this, this gooey thing that we, ooh, that, that mushy thing of love. God's love is filled with holiness and filled with justice. Jesus Christ suffered on our behalf because God is a just and yet a loving God. And he sent Christ to die. God demonstrated his own love by sending Christ to rescue us from the essential penalty of sin. And that's, that's, that's key. Now, as we also look at this, we should realize unity is motivated and it is measured by our commitment to one another, by the concern that we show for one another, by the compassion that is evident by the relationships and the various activities where we're involved. And unity is motivated and measured by our connectedness. Are we together on this? Are we working together or are we working apart? Are we emphasizing our differences or are we emphasizing our similarities in our unity in Christ? And if we consider all of this, I actually, I, I have... Uh, you know, a, a list that, that, I, that I found. And this, I think, uh, I misplaced it. Hmm. Oh, I found it. It was under another set of notes. I, I, I'm, hey, I'm human. I, I, uh, I wish that when I preach and teach that I could be just so casual in this way and, and all that I think is important but first thing love is greater than faith and hope because love's eternal faith and hope are temporal love is the greatest Paul says that in 1 Corinthians secondly love is the right response to God's love and grace in Christ we respond to what God's love says for us by loving others we respond to God's grace for us by loving others Love is the great commandment and is the distinguishing characteristic 
of a genuine follower of Christ. That's something that's clear. Love basically facilitates and, and contributes to Christian unity. Love is the thing that, that, that motivates, and love is also the thing that helps us measure our unity. Love is a lubricant that reduces the resistance that can build up between us because of life that happens. There are things that take place, there are things that happen to all of us that something else is said and suddenly we're triggered. And we need to realize that love is the lubricant that will bring down that, that sense of, of resistance, that sense of friction. Next, love is a key motive that enables us to obey what God has asked us to do. Love for God, love for others, therefore I obey, I follow God. God tells me how I can carry out these things through his instructions, and love helps me obey. Love is a stabilizing factor in our lives. It gives us that sense of security, it gets that sense of assurance. When we feel loved, we feel safe. Love is the goal of our instruction. Why do we teach? Because we love, because of God's love. Love is a commandment that literally fills every part of our Christian lives. We do everything in the midst of love. Love makes our service, service for Christ more beneficial. If we, it says in Romans 12 here, if we don't do things out of a commitment of love, then basically we're going to spin our wheels. Love helps us defend ourselves against Satan's attacks, Satan's deceptions, Satan's devices, Satan's distractions. Love is one, something that gives us a defense. God's love for us, he sent Christ to die on the cross to save us from the power of sin. And the power of sin is driven by the, the demonic forces. And love is a, is, is, is a defense for us. It helps us defend ourselves as we love each other, as we love God, as we just... Finally, love can and it should be growing in our midst. There should be a growing amount of love. But the problem is in the world today with all the challenges, love can grow cold. So therefore, let's realize the, the, the unity we have in Jesus Christ is something that will motivate us toward love, motivate us toward being concerned and caring and compassionate and considerate of others, be committed to each other. My commitment to Christ says I'll be commitment to Christ's family. And as we realize that, you know, that's a, a testimony that the church needs to give to the world around us. That's what I've got, and that's what God has. So let's pray. Father, I thank you. Thank you for this time that I've been able to sit in front of this camera and be able to communicate these truths. I thank you for what it says. I thank you for what it, 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 it impresses upon our lives, but I pray that it will be an influence through the power of your Spirit. Help us to see the essential nature of unity in the church. Help us to work towards unity. Help us to place emphasis on the unity in community. Father, help us in that. And Father, help me as I close this prayer to stop preaching, just start asking you for help. I need you. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your grace. I pray that you might bring revival to the church at large. I pray you might bring rev revival to our midst, Father, here at ACEFC. Revive us. Help us to be more and more what Jesus Christ has called us to be. And I thank you that you give us the, 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 the potential and the power for that through the work of your Spirit. Thank you, Father. Please help us, and I pray all this in the wondrous, the saving, powerful name of Jesus Christ. He's our Lord. He's our Master. He's our, our, our sacrifice, our substitute. So thank you, Father. And in Jesus Christ, we pray this and we say, amen, everyone, amen, right? 
Hey, thanks again. Thank you for watching. Thanks for paying. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm I'm excited about what was said in this in this message. God gave it to gave it to me step by step, and I'm thankful for that. And I just pray that God will use this for His glory. And I pray that that this Sunday in our in our church fellowship that God will use this message to have an impact upon my life and every life that's that's in our midst. So thank you, Lord bless. And uh, we'll be in touch, I trust. Be in touch with me, please.